The Mambas have just pitched up in the car park, so I'll kick off whilst they climb up the stairs. I'm sitting on the game tower at my little camp here in the Baluli Nature Reserve, which is the kind of western extremity of the Greater Kruger National Park. It's nice because there's no load shedding. I'm running off solar panels and there's no um, noises from airplanes and cars and trains and so on and so on. So it's the perfect zooming environment. Okay, so just to put you guys a little bit in the picture, morning ladies, please come and join me up at the top here. The staircase is over there. Don't fall because it's far. <laughs> you can break every bone in your body if you fall off this tower. Um, okay, so here are some of our partners. Right? Again, everything that we do is a partnership. Networking is very, very important in any conservation effort that we make. So we don't work in isolation. Uh, our legitimacy comes from the fact that the Department of Environmental Affairs through the South African National Parks Board has been supporting our pro programs for quite a while. Akshay, man. Yeah, do you guys want to grab, just come and say hello quickly. Introduce yourselves. Hello, I'm Colette. Hi, I'm Felicia. That was a quick introduction. Welcome, <laughs> ladies. <laughs> I forgot to get them chairs. Chivalry is dead. Okay. <laughs> So, um, and then of course, I'm sitting in, in the Baluli Nature Reserve. The, all these projects fall under one big banner of Transfrontier Africa. Okay, that's the boring introduction. I'm going to just move on, if I can figure it out. Why is it not moving on? It is, okay. All right, if you have a look at this, this is a map of the Kruger National Park. The significance of this map, although the Kruger National Park if we talk about the Greater Kruger Park, it's a multi-ownership model, okay, which means there's a private sector, there's tribal land in the park, there's an international boundary. You guys have got to move a little bit closer so that you can see yourselves in that little square over there, okay? So shuffle in next to me like that. Dokey. Hi, guys. Sorry for the shenanigans this morning with the vehicles. You can blame it on the car, but I'd rather blame it on our mechanic, personally. Okay. Welcome, Felicia. ladies. Felicia has been with us for how many years now? Yeah, you're going to have to speak up a little bit. Eh? For almost nine years because I've been with the first intake in 2013. Yeah, so nine years coming on for 10 years. It's quite impressive. And what's your rank now? I'm an ops room manager. Yeah. Okay. I work at the ops room. How's the audio there, guys? Can you hear us clearly enough? Perfect. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, very clear. Okay, very good. So yeah, thanks, Sergeant Felicia Mogokani. And then? <laughs> Colette Mobeni, uh, I'm the supervisor of Black Mambas, and then I'm the admin of this Black Mambas anti poaching unit. I started with Felicia in 2013. So nine years, these ladies have both been, uh, been with us for nine years. So let's get back quickly to this map. Have a look at this. It's a 3 million hectare landscape, okay? But the irony is that it only occupies 3% of the South African land mass, which is quite telling. So this is kind of the Swiss bank account. That's how we like to see it. The Swiss bank account of our free range iconic animals, the lions and elephants and rhinos and so on and so on. It's our single biggest protected area. And although you find little pockets of, um, of these iconic animals in other national parks and, and provincial parks and even private reserves and so on, this is our main Swiss, I like to call it a Swiss bank account. If Mozambique doesn't succeed in their conservation efforts, the Kruger Park must repopulate Mozambique. The same with Zimbabwe uh, and to a lesser extent, uh, Botswana as well. I'm trying to find my little pointer. It's down here in the corner, but it's just a bit, anyway, I'll just keep clicking. So I don't know if you saw that little round circle that's appeared on the landscape. That's where we're sitting now, okay? But just bear in mind, guys, if you look at the challenges of the Kruger Park, it's orientated in a north-south direction, yet the watershed is sitting to the west. Uh, the animals want to move in a linear fashion, in an east and west fashion, yet the park at its widest point is 60 kilometers. You know, so you can imagine an elephant bouncing off the fences. You can imagine the human wildlife conflict issues. The, the tribal lands and the villages and what have you are all situated along the western boundary in our case and excluded with a big scary fence so all along this this fence over here with mozambique is down as you know okay so the animals are free to move into the limpopo 
uh, national park on this side over here in Mozambique. It's quite a significant international uh, transfrontier park. Okay, ladies, this is your stations. We've got the ops room manager over here. Now I've got the senior admin for the Black Mambas as well. So this map is quite familiar to you. This is where the Black Mambas are distributed around the landscape. From the most southern team to the most northern team is about 90 kilometers apart. So the operation center has to coordinate them. Uh, I mean, you can't drive 90 kilometers backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. So we have a central operation center and our headquarters sitting there on the Ecotuleni Conservancy. And uh, it's your guys' job eh, to keep it all together. The radio networks and so on. This little model over here is the, the basic structure of the anti-poaching units. Now, remember, a traditional policing model is to detect, to pursue, to apprehend, and then to prosecute. Okay, so we've got a slightly different model. If you put it on an X and Y axis loosely, all right, and on this vertical axis over here, it's the level of training, the, the level of danger, the, the, the expectations, whatever you want to call it. And then here on the X axis is the amount of hectares covered or the amount of personnel deployed and so on. And you can see the broadest part of the pyramid. We have many more boots on the ground in the Black Mamba unit. Then the next level up is the tactical armed response, which is a really small team. And then right at the top is really just three of us sitting and doing the strategic deployment and management. So the majority of our investment, in other words, is going into the young ladies from the communities in the Black Mamba teams. They're covering big hectares, a lot of hectares, a lot of kilometers every day. Then everybody's face, it's the bobbies on the beat. If you ever get a chance to go to London, you'll know what I'm talking about. They have a lot of unarmed police officers walking around. You can't go anywhere without seeing them visible policing they're the eyes and the ears the first line of defense they must make the landscape undesirable unprofitable to poach okay if they get into any kind of trouble then it escalates up the pyramid to the next level and the operation center will call and say hey i need armed response please there's something going on here and then right at the top we sit down and we drink a lot of coffee and we say hey let's move the team to that place because that's where the targets are tonight, et cetera. And then the last part of this is the information gathering. We can't really be very successful unless we have information coming in. And information doesn't necessarily mean from an informant that you meet behind a sneaky wall at nighttime and give him 10,000 Rand and he says, hey, that Toyota Corolla is going to drop six people off under the tree tonight and they're going to come and poach. That's only one form of intelligence. Another form of intelligence is knowing where the rhinos are before you deploy so that you can protect them effectively at nighttime. Another form of intelligence is saying, I've got five building projects on that massive landscape and there are people working and living there unattended. Let's go there and introduce ourselves and make them aware that we know that they're there. We write down their names, we look through their bags, we walk around and we say, guys, please, if you see anything, here's my number, let me know. And they go, mm, you know, I might have wanted to poach, but now these people know that I'm here and so on and so on. So that's the the, the kind of proactive approach to this thing. Okay, so why don't you guys talk a little bit about who are the Black Mambas? And I'll smoke my pipe whilst you talk. It's breakfast time. Okay, uh, the Black Mambas, the young uh, women from the communities, uh, Black Mambas, we are aunties, we are mothers, uh, some of the some of the members there that are the breadwinners in the houses. So we come from the different communities. Um, black members, we are proud of the job that we are doing, and we are making we we are protecting our environment and conservation itself and the animals. So doing our job as we, when we first started with our job, people were not sure about what we are doing because we, we, we come from the communities where it's a taboo way, a, a woman will be a field ranger. So when we started, people were not believing in us, but because of the job that we, we were doing and they were seeing the outcome of our job and be, now they're starting to believe in us. 
and uh, Black Mamba Santi Coaching Unit, we don't carry guns. We are the eyes and the ears of the reserve. Mm. Thank you, ladies. I've just been through half a box of matches. If there's one symptom that is wrong with this province, it's the fact that the matches, you can't light a pipe. Half a box of matches and only one of them worked. Okay, thank you, ladies. Why, why do you think it's significant that we chose young women to fulfill this role? Why didn't we just go and get a bunch of men like everybody else does? Uh, I personally believe that uh, women are the caregivers in the communities and women, they have uh, secrets where they cannot be bribed by someone. Maybe someone will come and give me money so that I can be a spy in the reserve or I can help him to kill a rhino. So because of we are natural beings of being caregivers, we are able to do our job. So I believe women are the best. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> but if there's one thing that I think is very, very significant for us as conservation managers, you know, we don't have a very long lifespan on this planet. In fact, the, the elephants will outlive us and most of the other animals will outlive us by the time we get into a position uh, of senior management where we can make decisions and change policy and so on. So our investment is short lived in the greater scheme of things. We want to see a multi-generational return on any kind of investment that you'll make. So you can see that we've got five environmental educators in the team as well. We'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment. But the, the significance for me of employing young women is that they are going to become mothers and then soon grandmothers in that community. And you guys are already there, okay? With the mother part, I don't think you're a grandmother yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, working on it. But th that is important because the knowledge base, the ethos, the, 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 the work that you do, you're taking that home and it's spilling over to your children and to your peers in the community. And eventually when you're retired and you're sitting there and you're looking after your children's children, you're also going to be telling them the coolest stories yeah. about the lions and the elephants. Not about, I have a machine gun and I shot at people. It's going to be about what I saw on patrol and how scary it was when I was surrounded by elephants, but how amazing it is to watch them playing in the water holes and so on and so on. That's a, a, a message. Money can't buy that kind of intervention. Is somebody in the waiting room? Oh, it's not my job, I don't think, to push that button. Right. Prevention. Guys, it's all about prevention. Look at the picture on the left-hand side. That is a traditional anti-poaching or policing model. You lie in the bush, you disguise yourself, as cool as it might be. It's called a ghillie suit, the guy's wearing. And then when the naughty person walks past, you jump out. Hey, you know, and you grab them and you fling them on the ground and put the handcuffs on and so on and so on. You, it, it has very mild success. We always have to evaluate whether our interventions are actually working or not. So, you know, after you've deployed, it's really important to then evaluate continuously to say, yes, this, this is a success or this is not a success. To put those kind of um, valuation techniques in place, especially with something like environmental education, when the objective is to change people's minds and people's values and how they perceive things and whatever. That's really, really hard to quantify. And as students, you guys are going to meet this challenge throughout your entire careers when you, when you finally get into a work placement. And it's the same with law enforcement. How do you, how do you evaluate your success? Is it with the amount of people that have arrested? Is it the amount of rhinos that have been poached has been going down? But then people say, well, what about the variables? Maybe there's less rhinos on the landscape. You say, yes, but we arrested a lot of people. You say, yeah, but in arrested versus the amount of rhinos lost. So it's not a successful model if you've made 10 arrests, but in the process, you lost 1,250 rhinos, which is more or less what happened annually up until uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So you take that picture on the left-hand side of the traditional policing model, and you say to yourself, my objective with an anti-poaching unit is not to arrest people, but maybe it's actually to save the animals, to prevent them from being poached. Then you look at the picture on the right-hand side, where you've got a mobilized community with 23 plus the five educators, plus the ops room managers, blah, blah, blah. It comes up to 36 young women employed from the local communities and deployed inside the park and inside the community. 
there they are mobilized all the kids and everybody running around behind them big banners up we don't support poaching we don't harbor criminals in our communities we work for peace we stand for justice all of these messages must come out okay and that's a i can't say the the one technique is going to save us all we might need a combination of these things which is why our biggest investment is in the right hand side but we still have an investment in the left hand side because what happens if the right hand side picture says hey i've got information there's a poacher here and it's coming to shoot rhinos or, or steal pangolins or whatever it might be then you still need to have what's happening on the left hand side to intervene but just remember where your investment goes okay you must decide now what is best am i going to put all my money into guns and bombs and helicopter fuel or am I going to have a little bit of money for that when I need it? And I'm going to invest all of my money into what's happening on the right. Okay. This, this is the, the reality. As much as we like to paint a pretty picture for our... Uh, show it. I'm a little twitchy with this finger. Yeah. All right. What's happening here, ladies? You remember these cases? Okay. Can you explain? This was at the height of the poaching in our area. It's a little bit sad. That's a little elephant on the left-hand side was caught in a snare. Yeah, you remember that, yeah? yeah? Terrible. Can you guys say something about what is, you know, what happens here? Okay. Uh, in the field, we have two different uh, poachers. So the elephant on the other side, because in the reverse, sorry, in the reserve, there are people who are getting inside to set snares to catch uh, the bush meat. What is so a snare? Snare, it's a wire that uh, people set so and then it can catch. So in their minds, they want uh, impalas, uh, buffaloes, things like that. So they not uh, their target is not the elephant, but because they set that snare, the snare, it mustn't uh, maybe uh, ja choose if they want to catch impala or buffalo so that elephant was caught by the snare it was very painful uh because these people when they go inside the reserve they camp so and then they can go home with a lot of meat some of them they sell it some of it they just want to eat it so on the rhino when you are out see the dead rhino or dead elephant it's too painful and unbearable pain to see the innocent animals laying there uh, helpless. Okay, so, so, so yeah, thanks, Colette. What's happening here, guys, what Colette is saying is that there are many different threats to our animals. If you think anti-poaching and all you hear and all you see in the media is people running around with guns shooting rhinos and people running around with guns trying to stop the people running around with guns shooting rhinos. Okay. If you want to put it into perspective, on my landscape, we've lost approximately, yeah, not approximately, we've lost 65 rhinos since 2010 to poachers' bullets. In one day, snares will kill more animals than poachers' bullets. Yet all the investment was going into running around after poachers shooting rhinos. We have to say, what are the risks? What are the threats? If I take the train that services the mine that cuts the park in half, that train kills more animals in one year than the poachers did in 13 years. You know, so as conservation managers, you have to have a look and say, what is the state of the nation? Am I going to invest all my money into helicopter fuel, guns, bombs, ETC, just to run after one thing? I can't ignore that thing. I must address that thing. But what are the other risks on my landscape? And when somebody is coming in to set snares, exactly what Colette said now, it's an indiscriminate killing machine. It's like fishing. You put a piece of bait on the end of your hook and you throw it in the water. There isn't a little sign on that hook saying, I only want a bass. Everything's going to bite it. You might even pull up an otter. Who knows? I don't know. I don't fish, by the way. So I have no idea what I'm talking about. But it's with a snare out there in the bush. That guy might have actually set that thing because he wanted to put food on the table. But the reality is that any animal that walks past could get caught and killed exactly what happened there. And then it becomes opportunistic. And the guy goes, hmm, didn't anticipate that. But hey, look at this cool ivory. Have a look at how the poacher's behavior has modified over time. So 
when I said, how do you evaluate our success? Remember when we started out here, they just purchase would poach in the daytime. They come in, they set snares in the day, they walk around and they were camping in the bush and so on. Eventually they had to operate in the middle of the night. Then they couldn't use torches. Then they could only come in during the full moon periods. Now, do you remember the full moon patrols? Yeah. Mm. And, then, and then they started putting sponge under their shoes so the mamas couldn't see their tracks. Then they started putting silences on front of their weapons. Then they start covering the carcasses with branches so the vultures can't find it because we use the vultures yeah. to tell us where the carcasses are. And then you pick up on the tracks and you go. So all of those different behavioral changes that the poachers went through kind of indicates to us that we've put them under quite a lot of pressure. So that's one way that you can use to say, am I being effective or not? Uh, we are um, black members. Each and every morning we have two groups. So the other group will go to the fence and patrol the fence, monitor the fence. If there is any cuttings on the fence during the night or any tracks that can lead us to something suspicious, each and everything that we pick up on the fence line, we, invest, we investigate it because we'll never know. Even if it's a paper, a piece of paper or a a bottle we have to investigate uh, where is it coming from because you will never know maybe poachers uh, got inside and then dropped that bottle so we monitor each and everything that will come along the fence line while patrolling so we also check for any diggings of animals trying to get outside the reserve because we are near r40 road so animals must, must be inside the reserve so that they cannot be killed by cars and everything so when we find uh, any diggings on the fence line we put some rocks and close it up so that the animals will not get it outside the reserve as the picture shows there uh, one of my colleague putting some rocks to close up the the space underneath the fence yeah thanks ladies it's it's really important for us when we talk about protecting animals we don't just protect animals uh, by catching poachers or by stopping poachers okay if an animal gets out of the park it's going to uh, let's say that's lions and we've had that many times or hyenas or what have you those little guys are going to cause human wildlife conflict in the community by eating cattle or stealing chickens or, or just terrorizing the people in the streets at night now we have an obligation as conservation managers to reduce human wildlife conflict so the early detection is not just to detect where the poachers have come in and out of the landscape but it's also to alert the community and say hey we've got some lions out you know just give us a chance we'll find them we'll get them back or we'll address the problem so that early detection those eyes and ears are so critical in so many different ways ladies now it's coming to winter and the leaves are falling off the trees and for the academics out there, the crude proteins are being absorbed from the from the vegetation back into their storage organs, whatever you want to call it. That means our elephants are going to try and get out again. Uh, and you guys are going to have a tough time following up on elephants. Also on the left hand side, you'll see vehicle patrols. It's very visible. We all know that a poacher is going to hear you coming in a vehicle 100 miles away and they'll run away and, and duck and dive. But that's significant. It's covering the landscape. We can't walk at night. Why don't we walk at night time? <laughs> uh, we can't walk at night because at night is dangerous and then again we want to be visible we want to shine the spotlight so then the poachers can see that we are there they mustn't try to, to take chances so that's why we can't walk at night we need to drive and uh, we need to patrol all the roads that are inside the reserve mm. The biggest risk on the landscape is not from the poachers. The biggest risk on the landscape, especially at nighttime, is the wild animals. We are surrounded here. Remember, it's a big five environment. Okay, so here's some of the activities that you guys do. You need to speak a little bit about these. Start at the top left. Okay, so... Top left, it's the members who are, do, are doing a roadblock. So each and every week, uh, Monday morning and Friday afternoon, evening, I can say evening because five o'clock, 
why we do our roadblock on Mondays is because the contractors that are working inside the reserve, that are coming back from home. So we search them at the gate, Balula Old Front West main gate. We search them if they have uh, illegal firearms, gun or something that might harm the animals inside the reserve because sometimes they stay for a week inside the reserve so we want to check them if they don't have something that will link to a rhino poaching or something so on fridays we also check them when they are going out to home we check them if they don't have something illegal that they took from the reserve uh, it can be uh, ivories it can be um animal dung, something, maybe bush meat, something that will link to an illegal activity. So we, we make sure that we search them before they go home. So uh, snare sweeping, uh, that one members were coming back from the sweeping, because uh, at first we used to collect a lot of snares that people used to set, but now we will automatically maybe sometimes come back with one snare. Uh, because now people, they know that we are there. So, and then sometimes there are only all the snares that were set long time, but these days we normally don't come back with a lot of snares. So sharing knowledge with our communities. Uh, we even have the program that is run by Luane Maifela at Palavura. So we go to school to help her educating the children since we are mothers, we are grannies of tomorrow. So we educate them about the environment and the nature itself. So we know that uh, educating young children is like investing in them because those young children, when you tell them things, when they arrive at home, they will share with their uncles their fathers and their sisters and their grannies. Since a um, lot of grannies, they don't uh, know the importance of saving the environment. So saving uh, the environment, we need to ed educate young children. And again, because when we grow up, we only know that if you go to varsity, you will just do teaching and nesting and uh, police. Uh, while there are a lot of opportunities in nature conservation. So we are trying to change that mindset in young children in schools. Thanks guys. You know, the last slide over there, during the pandemic, uh, a lot of people were laid off from the lodges, et cetera. The wildlife economy is huge. It employs so many people, you know, in, in a, um, an expensive game lodge, there's 3.5 people working at that lodge per guest. Okay, so that's a significant employment model and it's a big part of the wildlife economy. Yet when along comes COVID and these guys are sent home without any pay and what have you, and we thought, you know, we've made such a big investment into the community. And now the only way that they can put food on the table is to come back into the reserve and poach, set up snares or whatever it might be. And the Mambas went out and identified 90 families. Eh? 90 families using a little survey technique and delivered food to them and vegetable gardens and all kinds of things for food security yeah. just to say guys we haven't forgotten about you please don't poach we'll make sure you've still got food on the table make our lives easier we don't want to catch poachers man we want to save animals okay here's our little canine unit who's that is that Eva Joy and Olile can anybody Tell me what's happening here. So we do have a canine handlers uh, that were trained to handle dogs. So as the picture is shown here, so they were patrolling with their dog. Um, our canine handlers, um, the dogs are sniffing dogs. They can sniff a illegal a product like a illegal gunshot or maybe a rhino horn. Uh, they were trained to do that. So. That's wonderful, colleague. And then we had, uh, we, sorry, we have Golile. She once worked at OR Tambo with uh, her sniffing dog at Johannesburg. Yeah, it was it was a proud moment for us. She spent a whole year using her detection dog to look for illegal wildlife products that were crossing the border. The um, the other significant thing about canines. It, it gives it gives you more confidence when you're patrolling because they'll protect you against wild animals 
And also anybody looking in will say, wow, I can't mess with these ladies because even though they're unarmed, they have the scary thing with very sharp teeth, you know, that's going to defend them. So there's another technique. The, the other thing is there's a lot of uh, pets in the communities. And we are asking people to look after wild animals and show compassion towards wild animals. But in the community, we have to try and say that that ethos doesn't just extend to warthogs and, and impala and so on. There's also a, a duty on the owner of those pets in the community to look after their animals and the donkeys that pull the carts to get the kids to school and so on and so on. And by having a canine unit, that ethos is much easier. They understand part of the dog handling course, the training course is very much about animal well-being, animal health, uh, animal care, etc. Oh my goodness, remember these days. <laughs> What's this? Uh, so this is some of the bush kitchen that was made by uh, poachers uh, in our buffer zone. So before Mambas were, were, deployed, were, were deployed, so it used to be their, their, their bush chicken. So we destroyed the bush chicken. We find them with... Uh, bush chicken. Bush chicken. Bush chicken. Bush chicken. Kitchen, bush kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> we find them with bush. They were they made bush kitchen in the bush, like because there were no members, there were no one who was patrolling the the the, the buffer zone. So it was their perfect spot. Spot. They will stay there for days, um, killing animals, bush meat, and then they will take mm. it to the community and sell the meat. Because I don't think they were going to support their families, obvious. Because there were a lot of meat, there were a lot of meat. They were going to sell it in the communities. So we were able to destroy the bush kitchen, and then the people were chased away from the buffer zone. Yeah, thanks. You know, we had six of these on the landscape, eh? and we didn't even know these guys were living inside the protected area, and the meat is hung up. So they always choose like nice bushy areas so the vultures don't give it away. And they were processing the meat here. It was a huge industrial level poaching event. We had to get flatbed trucks in to load up all the snares and so on and so on. It's a, it's, it's crazy that these things were going on under our noses eh? before we deployed the mambas that are covering a lot of ground. So remember that picture where the guy was lying in the ghillie suit in the camouflage waiting for a poacher to walk past? It's really important to cover a lot of ground. And what the mamba said earlier, look for any signs. And work in the same area. Don't rotate your rangers time and time again because a lot of anti-poaching units will say, no, we must rotate people so that they don't become entrenched in corruption and so on and so on. And they, they know the people, they can bribe the people. We say we have a different model because we employed young women. We want them to know their area so well that they can say, hang on a minute, I don't recognize that set of footprints. Or hang on a minute, I was here earlier this morning and that piece of paper wasn't lying there. You know, and I know my poachers, that's a lucky star pilchard tin. You know, that's what the guys use to eat when they're in the bush and follow up. So that consistency develops institutional memory, institutional knowledge. They can say, hey, there goes Mrs. Jones dropping her kids off at school. Hi, Mrs. Jones. Oh, there's a vehicle I don't recognize. Let's find out what's going on there. So yeah, anyway, this gateway crime thing, I don't know if you've heard of the broken window syndrome. But we can't look past small things, somebody collecting firewood illegally, somebody grazing cattle illegally, etc. We can't look past that and say we're only interested in rhino poachers with guns because one thing will lead to the other. Okay, if somebody can get into your park to set a snare or to take firewood, it's exactly the same techniques that somebody is going to use to get into your park undetected to shoot a rhino or poach an elephant or, or a pangolin or something. Okay. Okay, this is a bit of a boring slide, but uh, what I'm trying to demonstrate with this is with our model, we're not going to stop poaching. We're probably going to displace poaching. So when we evaluate ourselves, we say, well, we've already displaced them temporarily. In other words, in time, we've displaced them. They're no longer poaching in the daytime. They're now poaching at night, and then it's full moon, and then it's only the last few hours left before we come back on duty. So it becomes a snatch and grab operation. They don't have the entire landscape to play on. Thank you very much. I've just received more fire making devices for my pipe. Uh, you know, so we've displaced them already temporarily, we call it. And then we say we've probably displaced them spatially as well. So they might not be poaching in our area because if they set a snare 
the next time they look, it's gone. So they say, damn it, I wasted all of this time and effort and so on. So let me go and poach somewhere else. And then eventually, because we just kept expanding, 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 and pushing the poachers further and further and further away and making it impossible for them to profit from it, they started going to other crimes. Cash in transit heists went through the roof, uh, burglaries and robberies and copper thieving and all this kind of thing started. And that worked really well for us because now suddenly it's the police's problem to deal with. And the courts are actually quite um, good at dealing with those things. Those are, those are actual cases. It's really hard to prosecute a poacher you know, because of the three elements of crime. I don't know if you guys have studied that. We work on a Roman Dutch law system here. There's three elements of crime. One of those elements is mens rea, it's called, which means criminal intent. And to prove criminal intent is very hard um, in a poaching arena. And you, you end up in court eventually, and the courts don't really know how to deal with it. The, the police don't know how to deal with it. But when somebody steals something, they've got vast experience with dealing with that. Okay, enough about that. Why do you guys not carry weapons? Can I ask you? Let's see, there's one more. There it is. Oh. <laughs> Because we do not want to live in the village or in the community with widows and orphans. Because if we carry gun, when we go to the, the reserve or when we see poachers, we'll start shooting at them while it's not right. Because those people are from our communities. Although some of them are like, you can't tell that this is a poacher or this is not a poacher. So when we see them in the community, we'll just shoot at them. And then it will go back to our community where the orphans will be there and the widows. And then again, we don't want to tell the ugly stories to our grandchildren because one day we'll become grandmothers. So when I'm sitting around the fire, when I grow up, I want to tell my grandchildren stories of elephants and rhinos, nice stories. I don't want to tell them the stories of blood and killing people. So, and then again, those orphans, one day they will want to come back and pay revenge in the reserve. So the revenge will come back to us again. So we are the role models in the communities since we are mothers. Yeah, thanks, Colette. It's, it's really important for, for me as well, so the person who has to deploy these ladies and ask them to do this work and then go home and tuck their kids into bed at night. You know, there's, this is not America or Europe where if you use your weapon, in the line of duty, you get a box of chocolates and a teddy bear and, and you go for counseling for the rest of your life, you know, and, and you, you watch Disney movies until you feel okay again. In this environment, if you use your weapon, you're either going to be arrested by the police for murder or attempted murder, or you're going to get deployed the very next day again and you're going to carry the psychological baggage of this with you for a long time. We don't want that to go back to the households in the villages. And can you imagine if you're a poacher and you're looking on the outside on the R40 provincial road and you say, mm, I'm going to come and poach in this place tonight. But oh no, what's this? The rangers are carrying these amazing weapons. And so now I have to reconsider my model and go back to the community and ask the guy that's the security guard at the bank in Hoodsprate or something. When you come off duty tonight, can you please just bring your nine millimeter pistol or your pump action shotgun? I'll pay you 10,000 bucks and you come with me to defend me against these ladies. Now they say, hey, all I have to do is avoid them and remain undetected because they're not carrying weapons. I don't have to worry about defending myself against them. So we're kind of avoiding this ethos where we're placing the life of animals above the life of people in the villages. And we, we're not asking these ladies to put themselves in danger. You've got to go home. Your kids have got to go to the same schools as their kids, you know, so on and so on. So I think that's very important. But at the same time, we can't ignore what the poachers are doing. So report, let the armed response people deal with it. I tell you a, a little secret, okay? This is, I'm 26 years in this industry now. Living in the bush, my camp has got no fences around. Elephants and lions come through. If you leave shoes outside, they're gone the next morning because either hyenas have stolen them or the honey badgers have got into my car the other night and ate all the seats because I left the doors open. So you've got to modify your behavior. If you're carrying a weapon, you feel too brave. You think, oh, I can just defend myself. You know, I can just walk. I don't have to keep my eyes and ears open for wildlife because I've got a big old gun, you know, and if that animal tries something, I'm just going to put him down. But now there's a herd of elephants. 
which one you're going to shoot first. You know, <laughs> it's much more appropriate that you are in tune with nature. One of the, the most bizarre things for me is we've got a lot of researchers that occupy the landscape at any one time. They're researching elephants, they're researching lions, they're collecting the feces of lions, you know, they're collaring elephants that none of them carry guns to defend themselves against their research subjects. Yet if you ask a game ranger to go out there and take someone on a walk or whatever, they have to have the biggest guns you've ever seen in your life. And I'm thinking, what about these researchers? How have they got away with it for so many hundreds of years? It's bizarre. Anyway. Guys, don't get into this industry if your motive is to carry guns and fly in helicopters, okay? Then you're in the wrong industry, man. That should not be your incentive to get into this industry. Mm, what do we have here? Yeah. Okay, so this is just some statistics. I don't like these kind of statistics because every anti-poaching unit is going to tell you how successful they are because we made so many arrests and we destroyed so many poachers' camps and, you know, and the snaring has dropped and that. But remember, it's a multi-agency investment. We have many NGOs that come and assist us here. We have many volunteers that assist us here with all of these things. We have the Endangered Species Unit, the Stock Theft Unit, the uh, other anti-poaching units that help us out all the time. So this is always a combined effort. We must be very careful to say we are primarily responsible for this. If we get information, it could be through somebody else's information network. You know, if we make an arrest, it's normally four or five different agencies there, including the Napopo Department of Environment, the police, um, the Baluli anti-poaching people, the Kruger National Park, you know, so there's a lot of people involved, but we do, we are very proud of what we have achieved nonetheless, but always be prepared to give credit where credit is due in these things. You can't say it's just us, eh? Yeah. It's, it's very important that. Um, yeah, my, my favorites of the, of the projects, other school groups there's 11 primary schools now let me tell you if you want to start an environmental education program there's lots of challenges when you go into the schools the first thing you have to consider is is this a, a nice working environment for the teacher there's no fans it's 56 degrees celsius under that tin roof in that thing there's no chalk for the chalkboard there's it's there's no desk for the teacher to sit at and so on so that's the first thing you must make it a pleasant place to teach so the teachers want to come to work, okay? And then secondly, how do you stimulate the child's mind if they're just staring at a brick wall and there's three people to one desk and there's only two chairs and there's no windows, uh, you know, et cetera. There's no stimulating pictures. How do you expect that child to absorb any information? There's, there's no stimulation. Secondly, these guys are coming to school hungry nine times out of 10. So we have to address these issues. If you want to impart knowledge and, and expect the kids to absorb it, and if you want them to come to school to start off with, they're not going to play in the river, then you must address those things first. Then you can get your lesson plans together. So that was our first mission, was to make it a pleasant place for the teacher and then a pleasant and stimulating place for the kids as well. So all of our classrooms have now got all these beautiful murals on the walls and ceiling fans and they've been painted out and everybody's got a nice desk and they all look very smart. And they get a daily meal, which is one of the crises of the, the COVID uh, pandemic that nobody actually anticipated was we've got 1,300 kids that come to our schools every day. They get fed when they come there. Now the schools are closed during the pandemic. So how do we reach out? How do we make sure that these kids are getting their daily meal? You know, so we did put a, a mechanism together and the numbers were very good at going around and we built a little resource center in a central spot that everybody could come there. It broke the COVID rules, but hey, people have to eat, etc. There's our little team that runs around in the communities. There's one of our classrooms now looking all very nice. It's even got windows. <laughs> and it's, this is all the work that the members do during the weekend, scrubbing the desk down, painting things, putting on beautiful murals. It's cool. What kind of stuff do you guys teach in the classrooms? Um, we're teaching the kids about um, conservation and environment because uh, some of the kids, they've never been in the reserve. So, and they don't know that it's legal to kill an animal in the reserve. So we teach them about something like that and their environment around them. So we believe that when we instill some knowledge in these kids while they're, they're still young, they will grow up having knowledge that uh, it's wrong to kill an animal. It's wrong to, 
to not protect your environment, the environment you are living in. Because I believe that kids are born curious. They are always keen to learn. So we try by all means to teach them about the environment around them and the conservation itself and how to protect the animals and how to choose the right careers when it comes to careers in conservation. Yeah, it's very... It's very important. Thanks, Felicia. It's it's very important to have a structure to your programs. If you're going to go into schools or you're going to have an environmental education program, be very careful that you're not just there to entertain the children. Your objective is to impart knowledge. So the kids will come to school for entertainment, for sure. So you can do puppet shows. You can stand up and, and do a show and tell. This is what a snare is like. This is what a rhino skull looks like when it's been chopped up. Feel how heavy this piece of ivory feels. Blah, blah, blah. That's entertaining. Uh, kids, will, all of us will learn through using as many of our senses as we can we want to visualize things with our eyes we want to hear it we want to touch and feel it you know so try and stimulate as many of the senses as you can and at the same time have a structure so we've got 36 lesson plans that the schools have agreed on and you know if we have to teach mathematics we're going to bring our environmental angle in and say let's quantify how much water we're losing from the village tap okay this is a one liter jar let's put it under there and time how long it takes for this jar to be filled up and then times it by all the leaky taps in the school and see how much water we're losing in one hour. Times that by 24 in one day, so on and so on. So that's how we're imparting knowledge to the kids and it's, it's interactive, it's, it's um, touch and feel, you know, we take them down to the river, we'll do a little SAS assessment and teach them about how the pollution of the river is affecting their health and their quality of lives and so on. This is the kind of stuff that we we had to do during the COVID pandemic. That's our little resource center now where everybody comes together. It's actually quite cool. And it's got solar power now. It's even got Wi-Fi. One of the, um, the things that I think is really, really important, if you want to integrate uh, people into the global community, hook them up to the Wi-Fi. You know, I mean, that's the best right. way. <laughs> because how does anybody else know what is fashionable now? And who these celebrities are and what the trends are in the world. And yes, it's a double-edged sword because you can do all sorts of other stupid things on the Wi-Fi as well. I think it's effective. <laughs> it is very yeah, effective. It's effective. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that saddened me tremendously is when you deploy an anti-poaching team, everybody assumes that they're going to become corrupted. So they say you're not allowed to carry a phone when you're on duty, you know, and, and everybody must give their phones in before they go on duty. So for 21 days, these guys have got no communication with their families. And we're saying, hey, we want to invest in a multi-generational um, component here and so on. And yet we're taking them away from their families for 21 days. So, you know, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit. So we gave everybody Wi-Fi, even in the community. Everybody has a smartphone so that they don't have to go home and tell their kids what they did and what they see on duty. You can show them and you can even, whilst you're out there, send a little video you know say hey check me out and they look at the elephants in the background and what what and you guys have got friends all over the world now on yeah. facebook and instagram and what what and we want the kids to become part of a global community wi-fi guys it's the way of the world that's my humble opinion would you agree yes it's, it's cool <laughs> <laughs> it is cool and it's entertaining okay here's a whole bunch of the different activities food security is a very important thing as well we have many vegetable gardens and boreholes that break down every five minutes but it's it's really important that people can see the fruits of their labor you plant it you water it you care for it and then eventually you reap the benefits from it either for personal consumption or for sale you guys have been to the vegetable gardens lately i know they're big now yeah. during COVID, we really went we like farmers now in those communities and it's really cool and you know not every kid is an academic so when we when we evaluate if you've got a lesson plan then you must test the kids to see if the lesson plan the knowledge is actually being imparted um, if they're still failing on your lesson plan when you write a little test then you must modify the lesson plan or modify your teaching technique try and find out why that information is not getting through to the children but then we realized that some of the kids are not um, born academics you know so they're not really going to uh, do well on a test but we can't penalize that. So the vegetable gardens and the scouts program and whatever that we've got helps them to gain points. We will evaluate them on the amount of time they spend in the gardens and so on and so on. So they can also achieve 
and pass the bush babies programs if they invest their time doing good deeds good work uh, helping out in the vegetable gardens etc cetera, etc cetera. one of the other things is, is something that that the mothers said to me is what do you do after the bush babies so you got the bush babies in primary school you make a, a few years investment in them and then you exit them from that and we thought heck you know this is a good point we need to actually keep it going so that's why we started the scouts program and the nature guardians so after school they can still come to the resource center and they can still be involved in the bush babies program yeah the magogos mm -hmm. do you want to talk about that the bush grannies you're going to be a bush granny soon <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, the bush grannies is the program that is started at uh, palabora where we have schools there so the in environmental monitors they visit the houses of families. they help them with waters they help them by doing the small garden to their homes they even take them to kruger national park so and then they can see wild animals in real life because some of them it's been a while for them to see the animals so we are giving them that we are giving them back that chance to go back and be uh, connected with wild animals. So and then it will be easy for us when grannies uh, have um, connection with wild animals, they will uh, educate their grandchildren too. While their grandchildren come from school, educate their grannies, their grannies will educate them back. So it's education that is there. <laughs> Yeah, it's excellent. It's that multi-generational investment again that we were talking about. Wow. Look how cool they look, huh? What's happening here? Mm, we are the role models. Uh, the Black members, we are role models because now in our communities all over the world, people uh, want to be us. I can say that because everyone wants to join us. And when you go home, people will ask you, when are they going to uh, hire more members in your company? And then we say, okay, well, we need donations, but soon. But you can see that people want to do what you are doing because they see the effectiveness of what you are doing because it's working. They can see that uh, we're doing a good job. So everyone wants to be us. So we're role models to our kids role models in the village and role models to everyone who believes in us and appreciating the job that we are doing uh, myself i will say that uh we've managed to break that chain that or we've managed to, to to cross the boundaries where people didn't they were not believing in us because myself when i grow up i only know that uh, wild animals only belong to white people while it's wrong because of the fences. So the fences are there to protect the wild animals and in nature itself. So now we are the role models because people in the community, when they see us, I will say we are the mirrors of the young generation in the communities because all people that are proud of us. When we walk along the community, everyone will say, hey, Colette, that's one of the Black Mambas anti poaching unit. When they see us in television, they will phone us. Can you please switch on the TV, TV so then you see what is happening? So people are proud of us. We are the role model of the world. Very good. They're a very proud bunch of ladies as well. I think I'm more proud though. Eh? <laughs> Look at that attitude. The badass attitude. Yeah, the badass attitude. Yeah. yeah, it's very true. And as, as so one of our, obviously, you know, conservation, you can't stop at the poaching thing. If a rhino gets poached and the orphans are left behind, then you have a responsibility to those orphans as well. An animal that gets wounded in a snare, if you have the opportunity to fix it, uh, look after it and nurture it, and then eventually release it back into the wild, you've got to go the full circle, okay? So we have a little team down there looking after the orphans, uh, and we've released three of them already. Eh? During, it takes about five years before you can release an infant rhino back into the wild, and it's quite a long process, but it was also really nice to connect the, uh, the mambas to the animals. 
because you get that. I was quite jealous. I also wanted to bottle feed a rhino, you know, instead I've got a mongoose and a dog. But yeah, that's an important component as well. There we go. That's what Felicia was saying. There's Felicia in the early days. <laughs> you still look exactly the same, except your hair has changed a little bit. <laughs> look at the smile. I always change my hair. <laughs> so it's important for us to show that we, we cherish life. In, in my opinion, we destabilize a landscape, a protected area, if our approach has been to place in the people's minds, we place the life of an animal above their lives. So, you know, if we are going to adopt the model where a poacher is a villain and, and we shoot them and we arrest them and we take them out of the community, can you imagine if that guy is a father and he's a breadwinner? What Felicia was saying earlier. And now we remove him from the community. He's either in jail or, you know, even worse and so on. We're putting so much more pressure on the young women, the primary caregivers in the community, but they must now pick up the tab and try and provide food and try and look after and so on. You know, so it's, um, it, it's those social pressures we have to try and avoid. You know, at the same time, we have um, live sales of animals. We have trophy hunting around us all over the place. So the ethos is animals are there for money. Animals are there to be used. Animals are there for white people to come from overseas and utilize. But if I want to go, and take one, then I get shot at. So we've got to try and say, guys, we actually approach it completely differently. We have a passive approach to this. And even an animal stuck in a snare, if we can help it, we will help it rather than just walk up to it and euthanize it with a gun. Because the message we want to send back through the Mambas is that all lives matter. And if we can help, we will. Hey, there you guys are. <laughs> So this is, was the our proudest moment in 2015 when we went to New York with Collect. Yeah, we were going to receive the Champion of the Earth Award with the United Nations. We were, <laughs> we were happy, extremely happy, because this was our biggest achievement. Because we we had uh, I think it's three years since started with the members, and then already we're receiving um, an award because of the job that we are doing. So I think uh, it, it gave us a biggest um, fans and <laughs> people to see that the job that we are doing is definitely effective and it's working because people are not believing us. So this showed that uh, women are the best in conservation and they're doing their job very well. And you, and you got to fly overseas, you got to see New yes, York City. The two of us. <laughs> and it was our first time flying, but we did it without Craig. Yeah. Yes, it was me and Colette alone. So we met um, too many people, public figures. Um, one of them, Ban Ki Moon. <laughs> and then um, a lot of people. Secretary General of the United Nations, yes. that was Ban Ki Moon, yeah. Victoria Beckham. Lots of celebrities that you will never see if we didn't join the Mambas. And for that matter, if we were not part of the Black Mambas, we wouldn't had the opportunity to go overseas and meet people and learn about some other cultures and everything and get to explain about our job and how things is done in Africa, how we protect the animals and our environment. So it's a it was a good thing for us and having to go overseas and explain about what you are doing, wh what is your job, it, give, it gives like a fulfillment. At the end of the day, you know that I've done something and people must get knowledge about the job that I'm doing. So it was a big, good break for the members to collect this award. Yeah, it was excellent. Yeah. So this is all the stuff that we've said before. Okay, so I'm just going to whiz through these pictures now because I think our time is pretty much up there. Eh? So, you know, being a, a breadwinner, eh, how many people do you guys support in your family with your salaries? It does a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, myself, I support my sister because uh, she's not working and uh, she lost her daughter. She was in conservation too. So I support her and my nephew. And then again, we have, um, I will say that my daughters, cause their mother used to work with us and then she passed on. 
then now they are our kids. Very good. Thanks, guys. Okay, Craig, thanks a lot. Thanks, Mambas, for, uh, for joining us again. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm first going to hand over to Christine. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well and is healthy. First of all, thank you so much for the presentation. The Black Mambas don't just wear amazing uniforms, but you showed us with that uniform comes great responsibilities. You showed us that women can make a big difference and inspiration for all young women out there. You showed us that anger for a poacher and violence, even though it's hard, it's not the answer. We need to get other methods and to get to the roots of this evil. Your work is very dangerous and we respect you for all that you're putting in and putting your life in danger for protecting the wildlife and even what you're doing for the community. The students of TUT really learned a lot and want to thank you for giving us your time to talk about what you're doing and what we can do one day. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for those kind words. Oh, thanks very much. Um, look, it was a, an extremely interesting presentation. I'm very impressed with the approach being used. Um, it has some resemblance to what I do in Australia, where I talk to communities and try to change attitudes about human wildlife conflict situations. Um, very different wildlife, obviously, um, and rather different communities, but the principles are very similar. And um, I think there's a lot to be learned from what these women are doing. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. Thanks, Ian. And it's also great to learn that we are, you know, all sort of facing the same issues and that we can learn from each other. That's fantastic. Um, Tony Blay asked, so what are the safety precautions for the Black Mambas? And, canine, and the canine unit, because it seems like when they are patrolling, they don't carry guns. So what safety precautions do you use? Who wants to answer that one? Uh, our eyes and our ears, because when we go out on a patrol, we have to be vigilant and we have to check our surroundings. Our surroundings. Uh, for example, when we are patrolling, you don't just walk and then you don't listen on, or you don't wait and listen for any sound or any suspicious thing that can tell you that there is a danger ahead of you. So we always vigilant and we make sure that we detect our environment when we are patrolling. So for an example, when you are walking and then you hear noise of monkeys, monkeys can also be a warning that there's animals, maybe lions, and then the vultures, they can be also warning that there is a kill. So you have to uh, detect your surroundings and always know about your in the, the environment that you are walking in. So our ears and our, uh, our eyes and to smell is something that is protecting us even though we're not armed. And then again, when you go to the patrol, we go with our walkie-talkie radio and our smartphone, which is Simo phone, where when we get uh, things, we type in and then we send straight to ops room. So ops room, if there is an em emergency that they will need to help us, they will report straight to our armed guard response. Very good. Does that answer the question? Yes, that was a super answer. Um, it's very interesting. Obviously, the eyes and ears, that's the short answer, but also your knowledge of the bush, evidently you're using that as a weapon as well. And that's fantastic. Your training, um, eh? Yeah, our training did help us because we also track. So you will check that, okay, today there was a lion that was walking here and the tracks are fresh. You have to see if the tracks are for this morning or it's for yesterday so i can personally say that the training really helps and again you cannot say that because i've been here for nine years uh, the animals knows me so i will have just to walk or um, patrol without maybe being uh, diligent or maybe to see or 
I detect you wherever I'm going. The bush is like a newspaper. You never know what you are going to come across uh, today because you may find out yesterday you come across a head of elephant. You cannot say that today I'm walking the fence, I'm going to come across the elephant. It might be something else. So you will never predict the bush. You must always be vigilant and know your environment. Great. I would say from, from my point of view, Johanna, what makes it easier for me to deploy the ladies in a dangerous landscape is communication and the real-time tracking. I think that's absolutely critical. So the members run their own ops room and that's where Felicia sits and she can see, she's got a heads up display of where all the members are. They can communicate with her directly at any one time. So I think communications using technology uh, is, is absolutely critical. Hmm. That's very interesting. It's a range of skills ranging from very, you know, uh, bush related skills to technology and employing all of them together. And that's keeping you safe. That's, that's fantastic. Thanks for that answer. Um, che Pang made a very important comment in the chat. He said, at first I thought this was boring, but now I'm motivated. Um, nature conservation is interesting. I can't wait to be deployed and conserve our nature deep from my heart. So, ladies, ah, wonderful. thank you for inspiring the students. Thank you. That is awesome. <laughs> Um, the next comment, a question in the chat, um, perhaps related as well to the previous one. I wanted to know if it happens that they catch somebody who's, who's from the community or nearby area around the reserve um, poaching meat. What will happen to the person? Will they let him or her go? How does that work? Uh, when we catch a poacher, normally we we don't when we catch a poachers as numbers we the tactical team get involved and then we call the police the police are going to take over from there because us we cannot do anything it just uh, give the police to we let the police to take care of the poacher and then they will arrest him yeah we certainly don't let them go if you catch a poacher you have to follow through with the proper policing model that's the that's the bottom line sometimes the members have to go to court and give evidence as well with whatever it is that they saw but yeah we prefer to apprehend and then call the authorities to take over from there mm -hmm. thank you craig um then the next question i want to know since you've said you guys don't carry weapons what do you do to protect yourself from poachers who are armed run away no. <laughs> uh, because we don't carry guns uh, we are just the eyes and the ears of the reserve when we see poachers carrying guns obviously we hide and call for armed response to come and help us and then again we make sure that they don't see us but we always are uh, try to follow where they're going so and then we can give the whole information to ops room while they report and one and other thing, poachers don't like to be seen. That is why they're sneaking at night uh, so that um, we, the rangers or the members cannot see because they don't want to be seen and they don't want to be caught. So they will make sure that they, they, are, not see, they are not seen unless if we track them and see them. But in most cases, they don't want to be seen because they know that they are doing illegal things. So they make sure that we don't see them. Exactly. Okay. Most importantly, it's about detecting the threat early enough and then concealing yourself and waiting for the backup to arrive. So we don't want the ladies to place themselves in a dangerous situation. But in our experience, the you know, if you do happen to stumble onto poachers, they literally drop everything and run away. These guys are not the murderers that everybody makes them out to be. You know, you can put them in the same category, maybe as a cattle thief or something, but it's a, you know, it's, it's not the, it, it, I suppose I must caution and say that there are different parts of Africa where the poaching is at that militant stage, where maybe our model 
wouldn't work under that set of circumstances, but certainly out here, it's working well. Mm -hmm. um, Craig, then the next question, very important question as well, from Denzel. To the Black Mambas, do you think you will ever allow men to join the, the project in the future? <laughs> Hell no, men are not to be trusted because uh, sometimes they'll go out and drink alcohol, so it will disturb our patrol orders and everything. So I think if we can be females, because we know that I have to work for my kids and it's uh, important for me to come back to work so that I can provide for my family. And it's important to go on a patrol knowing that when I sleep at night, I've, I've protected the rhino, I've protected an uh, interlopes. <clears throat> Thank you for that answer. Craig, do you want to add on to it? <laughs> yeah, I think, Johan, you know, men have got a role to play. We we have men in the support teams for sure. Okay. So one of the other critical things for us to understand is that the cultural um, challenges of deploying a mixed team. So we get this question quite a lot. You know, if I had a mixed team and I had deployed them in, in a, a isolated location in the bush for 21 days, the, uh, you know, the wives and the husbands of those people back at home will feel uncomfortable and uneasy. Mm -hmm. There also are not many mechanisms in place in this country yet to deal with, uh, you know, gender bias, uh, gender-based violence, uh, discrimination, and this kind, kind of thing. And in the past, when we did have the mixed teams, then we had a lot of these issues and the, the members felt like they couldn't really perform at their peak because they were being overshadowed by the men. The men would say, hey, you guys stay back at the compound and clean it. We're going on patrol. I mean, I come back, I expect the pup to be cooked, you know? And that's the thing. I say, hang on a minute. I've got the paramilitary training better than you. I've got more years of experience. They say, hey, know your place, you know? And we're going to go and sit on a tree. So it didn't really work out for us. Um, but there's no reason. I mean, I've, I've got lots of men running around on this landscape so there's there's a lot of place in conservation for men you can't just have women and you can't just have men i think women bring a different set of values into conservation that us men have been lacking in my 26 years i wondered why it is that everybody that i met has got their foot up on the bumper of their land rover with their shorty short short shorts you know and their nine millimeter pistol and all the cool badges and they, and they talk about helicopters and guns and walkie-talkies and so on and so on. I thought, yo, these guys are here maybe because it's cool. I want people that have a different set of values that say, hey, I need to do this job because it's important, not just to me back at home, but also to protect the wildlife community. See the bigger picture, if that makes sense. So that's why I think we need both. You know, we don't want to fly around in helicopters. We'd rather have the guys doing that. You know, we don't want to... Um, go and lie under a Land Rover and change the prop shaft for six hours at midnight. You know, we'd rather have the guys to do that. <laughs> Does that answer the question? Yep, that's a very good answer. Thank you very much for that. Um, a question from Lily. I want to ask if they've ever experienced an attack from poachers or even animals. Uh -huh. <laughs> choose, choose a story. <laughs> Okay, it's rare in our side to come across poachers. So, but our colleague in the north side, they do come across bushmeat uh, poachers. So for me, I think it was um, 2021, I was with Colette and the two gentlemen from German. So we're patrolling the fence. And <laughs> in my years of being a black mamba, I've never been uh, in contact with uh, animals or anything. So we're walking there. We were five. Yes, it was two gentlemen and three black mambas. So we were patrolling the fence. While we were still explaining, because when we are walking, we are protecting the people that are not black members because we know our environment. So we are the one who is supposed to walk in front of them. And then maybe they will be in the middle of us. So while we're walking, talking, explaining to them, because we have to explain what we are doing and what is your normal day be like and the patrol orders and everything. So the, we bump into three elephants and it, it has babies. So it's like, 
it was we we didn't hear them because we were talking i can say that we were not cautious because we were talking to the gentlemen they explaining to them and then we didn't listen to maybe breaking of branches or any signs of animals. So the elephant started to chase us. The gentleman ran and then we left behind. <laughs> ran and left us behind. So we started to run because of the elephant was not returning. It was chasing us. But if it was in, uh, I can say that reaction differs from uh, what kind of an animal or behavior the animal is in. Because if the, the elephant were flipping its ears, we're supposed to stand still and get back slowly, but the elephant, they started to chase us, which means that they've been irritated long enough to do that they didn't even give us a warning or a sign. Normally, I, I can say animals, they give you signs before attacking you, but we didn't get a chance to see the signs. It didn't give us, uh, give us a sign. It automatically chased us. And then there was nothing that we can do rather than running. But it's not good to run sometimes. It depends on the situation in the environment. Yeah, remember Felicia and, uh, and Coletto in the operations room and in the office most of the time these days, but the other colleagues have been chased around by buffaloes and, and lions. rhinos and lions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of do you remember that story up in the north where they bumped into the pride of lions yes. and the lions had cubs? It, so, it was cute and cute and yeah, <laughs> it was cute and cute and there were three of them. Was it Tolile was with them? In yeah, those days? first time it was cute, Tolile and Kate. Yeah, so they were chased by lions and then they threw their walkie talkie, <laughs> their only means of communication. They threw it at the lions to escape. You know? <laughs> so we laugh about it now, but it's actually quite traumatic. Yeah, it's traumatic. Especially when you're sitting on my side and you're hearing it on the walkie-talkie, but yeah. you can't do anything because you're too far away. Uh, but this quickly, is the thing. Um, do you talk to the lions on the on the walkie-talkie? Yeah, we send them a fax and say, could you please <laughs> just go and lie down in the shade of the tree? No, but the, the reality, Johan, is that experience counts for a lot. And it's really, really important, what I said earlier about keeping your beat, you know, the, the, the same routine every day. That's how you develop a knowledge of the landscape. It's how you develop. You guys know immediately if you see a single lioness track, you'll say, oh, it's that old um, Madala Mafazi Ngala, and she's probably got cubs. That's why she's on her own and not with the pride now. You know, you must have that local knowledge and mm -hmm. you can't swap mambas or, or anti-perching people around willy-nilly all over the show. And also don't deploy in dangerous situations. So I'm not asking my anti-poaching ladies to go and sit in the bush at nighttime without any protection. So when they have to do an observation post, which they do have to do, they have to go and sit out there at night, then it's always in a structure that is protected from the wildlife. It's otherwise it's dangerous. And you'll read in the newspapers of horrible things that happen to members of anti-poaching teams. And I don't expect my rangers to do that. If mm. they're patrolling the boundary, they can nip through to safety on the other side. If it's nighttime, there's a vehicle. Uh, the communications is critical. If we know there's a lot of elephants in the area, then we will divert the patrol, you know, so on and so on. It's don't place your people in unnecessary danger. I promise you it's not worth it. Don't look for trouble. Yes, exactly. Um, Craig, uh, speaking about the fence, a question from my side, I would just like to know, do you have agriculture on your fence? Do you have human wildlife conflict with that? How do you deal with that? Yeah, we do every day. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the western boundary fence of the Greater Kruger National Park is actually a veterinary fence. It's actually erected uh, to keep animals in the park so they don't come into contact with the agriculturalized animals on the outside to prevent the spread of disease, as you know, foot and mouth and um, TB and all that kind of thing. So it's really important for us to maintain the integrity of that fence and to keep the animals on the inside. That fence was never designed to keep people out, ironically, mm -hmm. and yet that's what we now expect it to do. You know, so yes, when animals get out, which they do, 
we have to know about it immediately. So that's why it's important that the Mambas do what they do every single day. And they'll say, hey, there's uh, tracks of elephants going through the boundary fence, or I can see lines of dug underneath and they've gone. Then we can inform the community ahead of time and say, guys, there's something out there. We're going to put a helicopter up in the sky. First light, we will find these things and chase them back. And, and during the drought, I don't know if you remember, we had that terrible drought a few years ago. And we had 36 elephants break out, not all at once either, but drips and drabs. You know, and we got 36 elephants back on the back of trucks, well, a lot of helicopter fuel spent. But we have to show that we want to prevent the human wildlife conflict, because otherwise, how are we going to enthuse the community to respect the wildlife if they're running around and, and bashing crops and eating cattle and so on? Sometimes we have cows grazing right up against the fence as well. That's the reality. And then the lions walk next to them. <laughs> <laughs> That's peaceful coexistence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Watching the menu, but not eating. Yes. You know, we've got great technology nowadays. The, so the fence has got alarms on it and it's got these little comp so compartmentalizers. So if something does go through the fence, whether it's a human or an animal, it will send an alarm to the operations room and they will know it's exactly in that spot. So then you can send a vehicle out immediately to see what it was. And we'll say, oh, it's just Impala. They were rutting and the one bam bumped into the fence or the wild dogs herded something into the fence to eat it. You know, or, oh my goodness, an elephant has smashed through the fence. So, mm -hmm. you know, rapid response, early detection and rapid response for any threat to wildlife is critical, whether it's poaching or whether it's to prevent human wildlife conflict. That's fascinating. So um, it seems like you're also really using technology quite effectively to assist you. Yeah, 100%. Okay, quite, quite a high-tech ops room that you run. Mm -hmm. Craig and ladies, especially ladies, thank you very much for the contribution that you made. It was so enlightening to learn from you, you know, from, from you. Um, and you know it's it's not often that we get the opportunity to speak um especially for the students who are hopefully going to follow in your footsteps learning from people who are doing this and gaining from your experience so that's fantastic we really really appreciate it um <clears throat> literally award-winning rangers that you are thank you Johan. thank you thank you that is very kind have we addressed all of the questions it seems like we've addressed all of the questions. Guys, I want to say thank you very much for the opportunity. It was really very nice and sorry for the technological hiccups, but it still amazes me that we can even do this from our isolated location. Yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> and people are joining us from Australia. How awesome is that? Yeah, that is fantastic. That is very good. The, the Australians have actually been very, very good to the Black Mambas through the Australia Zoo, Steve Irwin's family. Yeah. Yeah. They've, uh, they've visited them on several occasions. The Mambas have gone over to visit them and had grand tours of the zoo. Now, what have you, where they've got the iconic African animals and so on. So, you know, Terry Irwin in particular is very fond of the Mambas and sends them words of encouragement and video chats and so on and so on throughout the COVID crisis as well. So we're very grateful for the Australians and their interest in Africa. Great. Yeah, we need to work together to make it work. Yep. Thank you, everybody. I think we're going to wrap up and say goodbye. We'll see you all next week, Thursday, same time.